Hi folks and welcome to our third video on Jill Deleuze's Cinema Books. In this video we're going to cover one chunk of chapter two all about the frame. A big aim of this video is going to try to be clear about how we get from all of that philosophical stuff about Bergson's philosophy of movement and time to the concrete formal aspects of cinema that if you've studied cinema before you're rather used to. Concepts like frame, shot, and montage. So let's review. What was Bergson's third thesis on movement and change? Remember this idea, that movement is transformation of the whole, not translation in space. And this was kind of summarized by Bergson's example of sugar dissolving in water. The idea that this is an example of something moving that is more obviously understood as a transformation of something rather than something simply moving in space. The water transforms into sugar water. The idea here is that we should look at all movement this way. So we tend to look at the soccer ball as if it's simply being translated in space, but this is also a transformation of a whole or of a context. Then Deleuze introduces two really important terms, holes and sets. The word set names a way of looking at movement as a closed system in which individual concrete objects, which don't change, simply move about in space. While whole is a term that helps us understand the same thing, the soccer ball moving, not in terms of a static concrete entity that is the soccer ball being moved in space, but rather as an entire situation transforming or changing. And here's where I want to be very plain and helpful about these two terms. So much of the cinema book is determined by set and whole, by these two terms. And just to show you what I mean, if you count the number of times the word set is used in the first book, it's 280. In the second book, it's 170. If you count the number of times the word whole is used in the first book, it's 300. In the second book, it's 270. One of the most alienating things about these books is the philosophical vocabulary that Deleuze uses throughout the entire thing. So that's one of the reasons we're spending so much time on chapters one and two, because that's the only place in the book where he's going to really spell out what these terms mean and why he's using them. So we have these two terms, whole and set, and then we have this third term, movement. And these two passages from the last video are the simplest way that Deleuze explains how those three terms are related. He says, in a sense, movement has two aspects. On the one hand, that which happens between objects or parts, that is movement as set. On the other hand, that which expresses the duration or the whole, that is movement as whole or transformation of whole. We can therefore say that movement relates the objects of a closed system to open duration and duration to the objects of the system which it forces to open up. So we can say that these three terms and how they relate to each other matter a lot for the cinema books. So we have two primary terms, which is set and whole, that we've already said is super important for both books. And then we have movement as the thing in the middle. And then we can look at movement in two different ways, as a set or as a whole, or as a translation of objects in space, or as a transformation of everything. And here's how we get from this philosophical stuff to the film-oriented stuff in chapter two. These three terms, set, movement, and whole, map onto these three terms, frame, shot, and montage slash camera movement. So once again, this is how we're getting from chapter one to chapter two. Chapter one being all about the philosophy of Bergson, chapter two nominally being all about the basic components of cinematic language and the medium itself. So you can see that chapter two is organized in terms of these three terms. The first level, frame, set, or closed system. The second level, shot and movement. And the third, mobility, montage, and movement of the camera. So if you've studied cinema before, or even if you have a working knowledge of the medium, you know the terms shot and montage and camera movement already. Montage for Deleuze merely means editing, and shot means a continuous recording of space-time. That is, the individual things that are organized in editing. Frame, in the simplest way of understanding it, refers to the fact that a cinematographic image is framed, usually with a rectangular frame. But I believe in order to think in a more of a Deleuzean way, we have to think of these three categories like this. That the frame of the cinematic image is literally a chunk of space. The idea that before you even turn on the camera or think of the fact that you're recording time, you have to cut out a slice of space. That's what film does. Secondly, a shot is a chunk of space time. The spatial component of where the camera is in space. 
but it also includes the fact that what you're recording is a continuous block of time passing. And montage or camera movement are chunks of space-time in relation to each other. In this video, we're really only going to focus on frame. So now we have a good sense of how frame, shot, and montage relate to space and time. But now I want to spell out a little bit more how frame maps onto closed set, shot maps onto movement as the intermediary between set and hole, and how montage maps onto open hole. So here's how you might think about it. A frame of the camera spatially delimits a closed set of elements. Those elements being the stuff in front of the camera, the people and the objects. A shot is a discrete set of elements enduring in time, and thus a unit of movement that expresses the transformation of a whole. And with montage, montage is the process of cutting shots together. In other words, shots are put in relation to each other. Thus, montage, or editing in general, is the means by which the open whole of duration informs the entire film. And this is the case largely because Deleuze privileges acts of thinking, acts of thought. And Deleuze only says that the movement image begins when filmmakers started to move the camera or stitch shots together. Those are the markers of consciousness, of thought, of placing decisions into the film itself. It's not merely film as a scientific recording mechanism, but film as an instantiation of human thought. Now I want to spend some time on what it means to think of the frame in a Deleuzean way. We're going to look at that first section of chapter two that only talks about the frame. And remember, we're going to emphasize the ways in which each of these categories is informed by those two larger ideas of set and whole. So, you'll see that word set right in the subtitle of this section. The first level, frame, set, or closed system. He begins, We will call the determination of a closed system, a relatively closed system which includes everything which is present in the image, sets characters' props, framing. The frame therefore forms a set which has a great number of parts, that is, of elements, which themselves form subsets. So once again, the frame has an equivalent with the idea of set or closed system. Set names the way of looking at the soccer ball as a static object that merely changes place over time. And think of frame as an equivalent way of thinking about an aspect of the medium of film. Keep in mind that you're looking at a film still from The Lone Dale Operator, but this itself is not part of the actuality of the movie. I'm doing this so I can illustrate just the fact that before you even record particular events in time, you have to create a spatial carving out of the world. And what do you get when you carve out the world? Well, you get stuff in front of the camera. You get sets, characters, and props. Just like identifying the individual soccer ball, to think of film in terms of frame, you want to pick out individual objects, the individual characters, the individual objects that might matter to me, especially the wrench that the protagonist holds in her hand. Framing, Deleuze says, is the art of choosing the parts of all kinds which became part of a set. These individual things are parts of a set. And then Deleuze is going to say that there are five things that he needs to explain about the frame. I'm not going to go over all of them. I'm only going to dwell on one of them, but I'll summarize them briefly here. Number one, the frame provides information, either a lot of information or a little bit of information, which is just basically a way of saying that there's a spectrum between a bunch of stuff within a frame and not too much stuff within a frame. Number two, the frame is either mathematical slash geometric or dynamic. Here it's a bit harder to figure out exactly what Deleuze means, but it seems to mean by dynamic he means that a frame can actually change its shape to match the things that it shows us, such as when you get an iris shot. That would be dynamic. Number three, the elements of the frame are distinct parts, but also components of a single composition. This is a broader point that resonates with Deleuze's larger philosophy, kind of like set and whole. We can count the number of objects in a given frame, but we have to remember that the frame itself creates a single aesthetic composition that isn't merely a cataloging of individual objects. Number four, every frame implies an angle of framing, some of which are narratively justified slash motivated, others are not and demand interpretation. So this is just reinforcing the basic fact that the act of framing is equivalent with placing the camera at a particular angle to a particular subject. And there is no such thing as a framing that lacks an angle, and that within a narrative film, there are particular kinds of frames that feel justified or narratively motivated. That is, I know exactly why I am looking at this particular object or set of objects from this angle. And there are other kinds of frames that make me ask, 
hmm, why am I looking at the world from this particular angle? This is a strange way of looking at the world. Perhaps there's a meaning that I need to think about. And number five, the frame both includes and excludes. That is, by definition, in cinema, every frame includes a set of objects that I can count, but it also, because it is cinema, excludes things. There is always an off screen. And it's this number five that I'm going to dwell on. And frankly, it's also the aspect of the frame that Deleuze spends the most time on. And the reason I'm going to spend the most time on it, and also I think the reason that Deleuze spends the most time on it, is that it has a lot to do with this dynamic between set and whole. So Deleuze begins a discussion of what he calls out of field. In its crudest form, out of field might be synonymous with what in film studies we call the off screen or off screen space. Deleuze even discusses the work of Noel Birch, who has an essay all about off screen space. For Birch, it's rather simple or comparatively simple. There are six kinds of off screen space. There's the off screen space to the left, to the right, above and below the frame. And there's the off screen space that is behind the camera. And there's the off screen space that might be behind objects that you see. It'll be apparent a little bit later that off screen space is not a perfect synonym of out of field. But for now, we can just think of it as a useful synonym. So for example, I'm looking at this image from Lone Dale Operator, and I know because I've watched the film that there exists in my imagination an out of field to the right. I know that this building has another room to the right because I've seen it before. And so when I'm looking at this particular room on the left, my mind fills in the gaps that there is in fact inhabitable space just beyond the door. In a similar way, if I'm watching this little sequence from The Marriage Circle by Ernst Lubitsch, when I look at this moment of these two hands holding their breakfast items and then starting to get off frame, I'm starting to imagine the actual romantic activity that's going on. The filmmaker includes certain actions so that I can imagine the things that he excludes. In this case, the affectionate gestures that these characters might be doing with their hands. So that's a kind of ordinary intro to film studies way of thinking about off-screen space. Filmmakers can choose frames that emphasize off-screen space and they can choose frames that de-emphasize off-screen space. And it's a rather important part of cinematic storytelling and cinematography. But remember for Deleuze, everything that he talks about aesthetically with cinema relates to his philosophical categories, in particular, the category of set and whole. So this is what he says to try to get us to imagine the significance of the out of field for his philosophical emphasis on sets and holes. He says, there are rather two very different aspects of the out of field, each of which refers to a mode of framing. There is always a thread to link the glass of sugared water to the solar system and any set whatever to a larger set. This is the first sense of what we call the out of field. When a set is framed, therefore seen, there is always a larger set or another set with which the first forms a larger one and which can in turn be seen on condition that it gives rise to a new out of field, etc. Okay, so he's saying that there's two ways of looking at the out of field and let's just talk about the first one, which is on display in this passage which is that because every frame implies the existence of what you don't see out of field, by definition, every set implies a larger set or quote unquote, another set with which the first forms a larger one. So this is a pretty basic point about what cinema is, but the philosophical significance of it will be revealed pretty soon. So let's imagine in this little film, Lone Dale Operator, the smallest thing that we see up close, which is in a way you might say the smallest set in a film that is composed of sets within sets within sets. The smallest set is this close-up of the wrench, which our protagonist is showing the robbers to reveal how she tricked them. But we know if we watch the film that this set is contained within a larger set, the spatial organization of all five characters within this environment. And that set is contained within a larger set, which is the fact that this room is actually part of a larger structure that includes the room to the right. And that larger two-room structure is contained within a larger set, which is the entirety of that structure that we've seen from the outside. And that entire structure, which is a set, is contained within a larger set, which includes the railroad tracks that are right next to this structure that we've seen earlier. And those railroad tracks are really important for my imagination of a much larger world that contains very far off places connected by railroad tracks, which is something that the plot hinges upon. And so when I see shots of a train just on tracks, I'm imagining how that train is inevitably connected to this space that I've seen earlier. So notice 
that no matter how wide you get, the film can be understood, and film in general can be understood, as sets within sets within sets. This tiny little frame of a wrench is inevitably connected to a whole network of trains. And even without thinking about this, my brain makes sense of cinema viewing in this way. Now, it's important for Deleuze that this basic fact about cinematic viewing, about watching movies, is related to the habitual way of looking at actuality, at reality. Set versus whole are two ways of looking at space and time, or movement. So imagine, for instance, that this is just a visual position that I look at a couple on the grass. Imagine my visual field is delimited by this amount of space, and that my brain sort of makes sense of this space in terms of these rectangles of, of action. That their movement is confined not only by the rectangle of my vision, but also the rectangle of the picnic blanket. But I know, and this is a big part of Bergson's philosophy, that every set is contained by a larger set, which is contained by a larger set, which is contained by a larger set. And I can keep zooming out in order to illustrate that. Remember, Deleuze says there is always a thread to link the glass of sugared water to the solar system and any set whatever to a larger set. I can think of these people as simply individuals moving within this confined tiny piece of space, but I know that they're always inevitably part of a larger whole, which is itself part of a larger whole, which is itself part of a larger whole, which is a set part of a larger whole, and this process never ends. Deleuze explains, the set of all these sets forms a homogeneous continuity, a universe or a plane of genuinely unlimited content. But it is certainly not a whole, although this plane or these larger and larger sets necessarily have an indirect relationship with the whole. So what is he saying here? So basically Deleuze is reminding us of a Bergsonian lesson. I mean, here's how I'd put that Bergsonian lesson. He might say, remember, we're still thinking in purely spatial terms. Thinking of reality as sets within sets within sets, a way of thinking analogous to thinking of the film frame, frames within frames within frames, is still not yet taking duration or the whole into account. You cannot think of everything that exists as sets within sets within sets because that implies one big closed set that encompasses everything. The whole is not closed, it is open. So if you engage in that imaginative process of say, imagining the sets within sets within sets in which a small little bit of movement takes place. You might run to the problem of saying, okay, there is one biggest set and that's called the edge of the universe. And indeed, there are major systems of thought that posit this. Now, the universe is one big giant container, but it's very important for Bergson, as it is important for Deleuze, that the universe, that is everything, is not a closed container. It is open. In other words, it is always changing. So after Deleuze is through thinking about this analogy between sets within sets within sets and frames within frames within frames, and after he explains that there might be a problem with our way of thinking about this, he returns us to the question of the out of field. So he might say this, all of this that I've just discussed implies something about the out of field or off screen space, which is where we began this very discussion. So let's return to the question of the out of field. Remember he said that there are two ways of looking at the out of field, and we've only talked about one of them. So he says, the out of field already has two qualitatively different aspects. A relative aspect by means of which a closed system refers in space to a set which is not seen, and which can in turn be seen, even if this gives rise to a new unseen set onto infinity. That's what we just discussed. That's the first way of looking at frames as sets. So what's the second way? The second way is what he calls an absolute aspect, by which the closed system opens onto a duration which is imminent to the whole universe which is no longer a set and does not belong to the order of the visible. He's going to tell us that there are actually particular ways of using the frame in cinema, in the history of cinema, that encourage us to look at the frame in the first way, and some that get us or encourage us to look at the frame in the second way. And though he doesn't say it explicitly, these two ways of dealing with the out of field map onto the films of the movement image and the films of the time image. And keep in mind that throughout both books, the movement image and the time image, he's going to discuss examples of the movement image and the time image. He will not at all confine his discussion of movement image films to the first book and time image films to the second book. So if we're imagining that these two ways of looking at the frame, which correspond to two ways of treating the frame in filmmaking, map onto movement images and time images, we might say that the relative aspect of the out of field is seen in examples in which we imagine a space that is off screen. 
So this is the first example. So once again, I'm just going to reinforce the very simple versions of out of field that I talked about earlier. Here, we mentally imagine the space to the right, which has been concretized because we've already seen it. Very straightforward. Another example from the film Inglorious Bastards. If you've seen the film, you'll recall that the opening sequence involves Christoph Waltz's character looking for Jews in hiding in this farmer's house. During the interrogation of the farmer, the camera slowly goes below the floorboards to reveal the fact that another character, who is a Jewish woman in hiding, has been in fact below the frame the entire time. So that when we return to the conversation, the interrogation, our minds mentally imagine the space below it as very important and as a major source of suspense. So here we mentally imagine the space just below the frame because it's just been revealed to us as narratively significant. Or here, as we've talked about earlier, we mentally imagine the space just above the frame because it contains the active hands of the lovers. Deleuze might say, the relative aspect of the out of field is seen in the examples we've just looked at, but the absolute aspect of the out of field requires a far more sophisticated analysis of time image films. So once again, those terms relative and absolute map onto set and whole, which map onto larger Bergsonian categories of our habits of mind of thinking about movement and the truth of movement as duration. So what the heck could Deleuze mean about this second way of looking at the outer field? Well, he starts talking about two filmmakers. One of them is Carl Theodore Dreyer, perhaps most famous for his film, The Passion of Joan of Arc, and other films like Gertrude and Ordet. Deleuze says, Dreyer made this absolute aspect of the outer field into an aesthetic method. The more the image is spatially closed, even reduced to two dimensions, the greater is its capacity to open itself onto a fourth dimension, which is time, and onto a fifth, which is spirit, the spiritual decision of Jean or Gertrude. So here in the shot compositions of the film, The Passion of Joan of Arc, notice that we're not getting a clear geometrical sense of how each of those shots is connected or how each of those frames is connected. Eyeline matches do tell us that they're connected, but notice how unusual the framing is with respect to classical framing. Deleuze wants to suggest here that these frames are in a sense spatially closed. I don't imagine the immediate spatial presence of what lies just beyond the frame, and yet it is this very closeness that produces a sense of the beyond, a spiritual beyond. Think of this composition here that you're looking at as somehow not projecting your imagination outward, but projecting your perception inward only at the shot. Andre Bazin, the film theorist, will call this kind of composition centrifugal as opposed to centripetal because there's a force that makes your perception go inward into the frame itself, not imagine the world that it is merely a slice of. Deleuze is giving us a sliver of film criticism, an interpretation of the entire film. In a sense, he's saying, that the strategy employed by Dreyer to create these frames that have us focus only on the face of Joan of Arc and deny our understanding of her as a full body in an entire environment or space is a way of visually communicating her connection to God or transcending the material world, the physical space that she literally inhabits. You can see something similar in Ordet, also a film that deals with religious themes and that deals with questions of miracle and representations of miracles that get attributed to divine intervention. This is a famous shot composition from the film. Notice the way that the frame is perfectly symmetrical. Even as the camera gently moves backward, it doesn't make us imagine the space that we're not seeing. It directs instead our attention inward at the composition as a composition. Once again, to repeat Deleuze, he says, the more the image is spatially closed, in this film, even reduced to two dimensions, the greater is its capacity to open itself onto a fourth dimension, which is time, and onto a fifth, which is spirit. So keep in mind that Deleuze is not saying that every time you have either perfectly composed symmetrical images, or, or in this case, images that are devoid of spatial depth, that you get the communication of time and spirit. He's not trying to articulate an absolute but he is striving to make a claim about the visual language of these films and how they go beyond the simple idea that the outer field, or in other words, our imagination of what goes beyond the frame, is simply confined to the literal space that we've already seen. Deleuze is trying to say that there is a way of making films that gets us to imagine what is out of field, that is beyond the frame, in a way that is not literally spatial, but beyond space itself. Okay, and that's how Deleuze ends his discussion of frame with a rather mysterious discussion of off-screen space. Next time, we'll talk about shot.
I'll see you then. Thanks.